Welcome to Terra at Home with your host, Chris Moretti. Good morning and welcome to Terra at Home. The long anticipated Easter weekend has finally arrived and of course with it comes a great selection of beautiful spring flowers to cheer up the festive table. I'm joined by Amy Dominato, our Regional Greenhouse Manager for Terra. Thanks for being with us, Amy. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. It's always such a pleasure having you on the show because you're telling us about beautiful live products from the Terra Greenhouse. Yes, yeah, inspiring things, Absolutely. fun things. Absolutely. Yeah. We've got a great selection of of Easter baskets and arrangements made to sit on the table or really anywhere in the home. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about the Easter product line and uh, what makes Easter flowers so fantastic. For us at Terra, we do our hydrangeas, our Terra grown hydrangeas, one of the most popular, most traditional plants of Easter. We're starting to do things a little bit differently with them, so yeah. um, that's really the Easter staple. Then we've always got the Easter lilies, the big white um, hanging lilies, um, our Martha Washington geraniums, and lots of other seasonal colors. And our greenhouses are full at that time of year. We're getting ready for the big bay. There's lots of stuff in there. So. Definitely. Hydrangeas, of course, as you said, have long been a, a big staple of, yeah. of Easter. Um, but we've sort of taken them in a new direction as opposed to sort of the old-fashioned hydrangea that sort of sits forlorn alone on the table. Mm -hmm. You've combined them with some really unexpected and beautiful plants as well. Can you walk us through some of the arrangements here and, and sh tell me how they've been combined? Sure. Traditionally for Easter, um, mixed baskets are really popular and they, yeah. they still are. People really like mixed baskets. But what we do well at Terra is color. So we've actually taken the color that's in the baskets and we've tried to make the color pop. So we're doing different things with, for instance, something like this, the monochromatic purple colors. We've taken some happy little spring pansies, the blue hydrangeas, and um, a campanula there. So it's, it's just using the color and really making them pop in yeah. different ways and matching containers and such. The matching container really, I think, bears repeating. That's interesting. And you can see that theme followed through all of our arrangements mm -hmm. here where we've got as you said, a monochromatic look. Yeah. This is something we talked about last spring quite a bit with mm -hmm. our, our spring yep. flower arrangements, that monochromatic is kind of a big trend, and that trend definitely continues yep. this year. Yeah, and if you have a color in your home or you accent with something, it really is easy to pull these things into your home and for them to just fit, right? Yeah. So. It's easier to match as well. If mm -hmm. you're dealing with existing table decor for your Easter arrangements or yeah. your napkins, all of that little fun stuff that makes a, a, a festive table festive, yeah. it's easier to sort of coordinate when you've got one color and it's all a very unified look. It is, it really is. And you can pull out colors that are in your decor. If your pillows have a touch of purple, you can put something purple in and it just really pulls it out. Purple is one of the, the big trend colors for this is, season yeah. and it certainly fits well with our Easter arrangements yeah, here. Yeah, something we have more of this year is the purple hydrangea and it's one of the most popular. There's the purple and the blue and they work really well together and it, it's definitely one of the most popular. Something else I'm noticing in all these arrangements as well are tropical elements, which mm -hmm. really sort of add a, a different dimension to arrangements in general. Yeah, just giving them different dimension. And there's also the, when you pull your basket apart, you do have these things that stay in your house yeah. as you continue. That's true. So mm -hmm. something like this, or, or maybe the bigger basket is a bigger thing to mention. We've got, we've got a fern in the front, we've got a hydrangea, we've got all sorts of different things happening here. Yeah. Um, this serves us really well for the Easter season, but as you suggested, you could pull this apart when the season's finished and, and oh, put definitely. it in your house and even in your garden? Yeah, everything in these little planters has a use beyond Easter. We've got, for instance, something like this or that one there. They've got the tropical plants, like you mentioned. That's something that you can just transition right into your home decor after. The hydrangeas actually all can go outdoors to your gardens. Okay. Um, and we've even got some perennials, like this little blue one here. That's a perennial, so that one actually can transition right into your, your perennial garden. So I think for those who, who find that interesting, what we could do is enjoy this throughout the Easter season and maybe wait until we get past major risk of frost and then, and then you can go ahead and plant these out as yeah. part of your, your planting season with the May long weekend. Perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. It's great when you're giving somebody a gift. It's that gift that they can keep, you know, they put the, the perennials out in their gardens if they come up every year, sort of a reminder of that gift. Nice. Yeah. So along with our mixed arrangements where we can pull apart different elements, we've got uh, single flowers as mm -hmm. well yeah. in, in trendy burlap. Burlap is a big thing this season. It is, yeah. Yeah, the natural burlap look. You see it in pillows and all kinds of things right now. So. Yeah. 
So even if you want something um, really sort of understated and simple, mm -hmm. you can take something that's maybe um, more familiar, like a Gerber a Daisy, yep. like we have up here in white, mm -hmm. and that can become a statement when used with a, oh, a pot cover. Yeah, definitely. And we've got all sorts of different pot colors and different colors that we can sort of mix that traditional plant with to give you a pop in your home. Yeah. But some some people may um, prefer a Gerber Daisy to a hydrangea, for instance. But that still can give you the pop of Easter color, but it can definitely go beyond Easter in your home too. So. Something that uh, I think Tara does really well is custom arrangements. Let's mm -hmm. talk a bit about that and how custom arrangements can work for your home yeah. too. Um, in each of our stores we do have a custom planting program and we have in-house designers that they'll work with any customer to sort of make them something that they want. If they're looking for something in particular or if they want something in a certain color or something specific for a specific person maybe. Right. Um, our designers will work with them to get them what they want and if they're not sure we'll work with them too and try to sort of get them to a decision you know what do they like what are they looking for and we always have we're always creating different things in store so what you see from one store to another you may see different inspirational ideas and things like that so and then it's easy to take a cue and to take um, inspiration as you said from things that already exist and maybe mm -hmm. just make a few simple swaps to customize it to make it your own and yeah. you can have that done right at the store absolutely mm -hmm. we're dealing mostly with very traditional Easter arrangements here and traditional spring flowers but um, something great about the custom program as well is if maybe Easter isn't quite your thing but you still want to enjoy the festiveness of it yeah I mean you could do a red arrangement for your Easter oh, table it doesn't have to be yeah traditional colors. Yeah, and we, we incorporate a lot of our decor and different stakes and things like that into our different planters and baskets. So you'll quite often see some pretty unique things. And some people pick out the different decor items and they'd like them added and we're happy to do things like that. Put That's the little cool. bunnies in or the butterflies and things like that. So it can get pretty fun. And it's easy to add elements of, of whimsy and really make it unique and, and it really is. a conversation piece inside the home. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It doesn't just stop at the table, though. We can bring that festive feel all the way to the front door. I yeah. see you've brought one of the welcome arrangements over here that uh, can go well outside the home, too. Yeah, Easter's still a sensitive time of year for us because there is a risk of frost, usually still that time. But we all want color outside the front of our houses at that time. So we still have, at that time, the bulbs and we've got the ranunculus and pansies, the spring colors. So yeah. we do all kinds of different things from you know um, colored pots with matching plants we do a great welcome line for the front of your door we've got the urns the urn liners and things like that so definitely mm -hmm. you can give your, the outside of your home a punch even though the weather's still playing games with us we can definitely do it so if you've still been hanging on to those greens from Christmas you can finally <laughs> pop out that urn liner <laughs> yes, and absolutely. bring in something fresh for yeah, spring definitely of course those color themes as well can carry through to all of our front door decor including mats wreaths the whole Easter mm -hmm. line is yeah. here and of course, you can find all of that at Tara. Thank you so much, Amy, for well, being thanks, with Chris. us and no showing problem. us the line for Easter. You're welcome. Thanks. More ways to get festive this season and to enjoy your Easter long weekend coming up after the break on Tara at Home. Come and explore the new Terra, where color lives. When we first bought the house, the lawn was nothing but brown. So I called my father-in-law. You know, he's really good with the lawn. He knows exactly what to do. Well, I told him, you're Scott's turf builder. He said, well, I got this other stuff. And I told him, take it back to the store. But some brands have filler, like sand and gravel, stuff you don't want on your lawn. Scott's turf builder is pure food. Every granule is 100% nutrition. You get what you pay for every time. You see what happens, Tim, when you listen to your father-in-law? <laughs> All food, no filler. That's the Scots Advantage.
Welcome back to Terra at Home, where we're using the long Easter weekend to our advantage. I'm here with Scott McDonald from Scotts Canada. Thanks so much for being with us, Scott. Thanks for having me. Glad to be back. You are our lawn care expert. We've met several times before mm -hmm. now. And uh, we're at about that time this season where we're starting to itch to get outside and into the gardens, onto the lawn. Um, tell us a bit about <clears throat> how to get started, when to get started. Is it too early right now? Uh, no, it's actually the ideal time, and this is an exciting time for, for me, my favorite time of the year. Um, as long as your grass is uh, not too soggy, you know, not too moist, you can walk around without making impressions in the ground, mm -hmm. then it's the right time of year to get started. Your grass should be starting to turn green and growing a little bit, right. uh, and that's the ideal time to get out there and start to work it. As we're taking our first walk around the lawn, um, it's all matted down, there are some bare spots. How do we get started to sort of freshen up and begin our regimen? Yeah, one really important step is just a light raking over the whole lawn surface. So, as you said, the grass can get matted down over the winter time. Yeah. Uh, you know, dead leaves, sticks, stones, all sorts of de debris collects. Uh, so a great time to just give a light raking, not too vigorous, because okay. the, uh, the grass is still a bit fragile this time of year. Uh, but a light raking will clean that up and sort of start it's on its way to its, uh, its growing phase. Now I understand um, you have a product that's perfect for use in early season that will help to prevent new weeds from, from forming in the lawn. Yeah, we launched a product a couple of years ago called uh, Turf Builder Weed Prevent. Okay. It's a lawn fertilizer with a weed prevent property in it. It's 100% corn gluten. Um, and ideally you put that, that down sort of late March, early April and the properties that the product have is to prevent new weed seeds from germinating. Okay. Um, so dandelions, broadleaf weeds, and uh, large crabgrass. Yeah. So if you had that problem last year, then it's certainly a great idea to put that down early in the spring. Um, and that will prevent new weed seeds from germinating, as I said. And you also want to make sure that you put that product down, if you plan to overseed or use grass seed on your lawn, yep. you want to make sure you put that down five to six weeks before uh, you apply a grass seed product. Okay, so we're not too late right now. It's with being late April, we could apply <clears> that <throat> now and then do our summer feeding starting toward the end of May into the beginning of June. Yeah, your, your early summer, late spring, that, yeah. that feeding, yeah, that would be perfect. And as you mentioned, so the, the Turf Builder Weed Prevent uh, Lawn Fertilizer has a feeding property to it, so okay. you could use that as your first feeding and then follow it up with your second feeding, you know, late May, uh, June. Okay. Yeah. Um, as we're walking around, so so that product will <coughs> help prevent new weeds. If right. we have existing weeds in the lawn, this can be a good time to sort of get on top of that and attack those before they really start vigorously growing. Yeah. Yeah. Ideally, um, we launched a new product last year called Scott's EcoSense Weed Be Gone. Okay. Uh, it's a new product and it is allowed for sale and use in uh, Ontario. So subsequent to all the pesticide and herbicide mm -hmm. bans. Um, so completely allowed for use and what that is is spot weed control. So any weeds that you do have growing that manage to uh, get into your lawn, you apply that product and within two to three days the, the weeds should shrivel up and die and disappear. Okay, and yeah, yeah it's a natural product that uses iron I understand to, to kill is. the It is. Iron is the key property so it gets within the cell structure of the weed um, and as I said it disintegrates and disappears in two to three days. Great. Yeah, it's a great product. Other products we may see this time of year are, are damaged spots from perhaps pets from last year or right. where things have gotten dug up or maybe salt damage from the winter. Mm -hmm. um, how, do we, how do we go about repairing those spot treatments as well? Yeah, there's really two approaches. The t traditional approach has been uh, a straight grass seed right. that you would apply um, perhaps with a, a soil amendment as well as a, a seed starter fertilizer. Mm -hmm. um, so that's still a great route for those that are comfortable doing it. But we also launched a new product last year called Scott's um, Easy Seed. Yeah. Uh, and that is a three-in-one product. So it has uh, grass seed, starter fertilizer, and a compressed core mulch. And the great thing about that product is that that mulch holds water a lot, uh, absorbs a lot more water and holds it a lot w longer than regular soil does. Yeah. Um, so it's all about keeping the seeds moist uh, as long as you can. Um, moisture for seeds is the most important ingredient in terms of seeding success. Right. And it's the number one reason why people uh, fail when they try and grow grass seed. Um, so again, keeps the seed moist for a lot longer and therefore improving chances of success. Something I really like about the product, when you told us about it last year, I used it for a few spots in my lawn where mm -hmm. there was a bit of doggy damage. Yes. And uh, something I really like about <clears> it is that the, the mulch itself kind of changes color it lightens noticeably when it needs more water so it's yeah. kind of foolproof it, it tells you when it needs to be watered and I, I think that's a really good 
point to mention. That's correct. It goes dark brown when you put water on it, and then within a day or two, if it needs more water, it starts to turn light brown, yeah. and that's the cue that it's time to uh, apply more water. So that's kind of our troubleshooting taken care of. Mm -hmm. As far as launching our, our everyday regimen or our seasonal regimen, mm -hmm. um, this is the <clears throat> kind of the time to start thinking about the steps we need to take to ensure a strong, healthy lawn all season long. Right. So the weed prevent aside, uh, we can start thinking about how to mow and how to fertilize, how often to do all these things right now. Mm -hmm. um, if we're not applying a weed control product, when do we start fertilizing? When do we start mowing? Yeah, any time really from towards the end of March all the way through April, you could put down your first application of fertilizer. The um, If you talk about the, the really simple steps in terms of having a great lawn care regimen, yeah. um, I like to simplify it by talking about proper watering, proper mowing, and regular feeding. Okay. So proper watering is one inch of water per week, a uh, combination of sprinkler or rainfall. Yeah. Um, so you can do that once a week for the full inch, or you can do it two times a week, half an inch each time. And it, you know, sprinkler rates differ, so it's hard to say exactly how long you should, you sure. should apply that. The best way is to put a rain gauge out there and measure how much water your sprinkler is delivering to your lawn. Um, but really, it's actually longer than most people think, so it probably takes two to three hours to put down an inch of water on a lawn from wow. a standard sprinkler. Okay. Um, so to give you an idea of that, then the second thing, proper mowing. So don't cut your grass too short. Make sure it's at least three inches high, which tends to be on the, the highest or second from highest um, notch on your mower. Okay. Make sure your blades are sharp. Um, and then... Uh, Feeding. Feeding. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Feeding is the last thing. So, so again, um, one of the simple ways I like to describe it is uh, feed every other month starting in April through October. Okay. So that will allow you to put down four feedings throughout the growing season. Um, easy to remember. It's about eight weeks in between. Um, and that is the best way to get a thick, healthy lawn with strong, deep roots. Okay. And in the end, it's really all about the strength of your root structure. So if you have strong, deep roots, you can withstand drought better. You can withstand disease better and withstand insect damage better. Okay. Uh, so all of those things are, are very important reason to have a lawn with strong, deep roots. So for new homeowners or people who are just maybe taking care of a lawn for the first time, those mm -hmm. are really the key components to remember. Just <clears throat> proper watering, proper mowing, and proper feeding will sort of set those great ground rules to have a nice, thick, healthy, resilient lawn. Yeah. There are other obvious steps like overseeding, like aeration, important things to do. Yeah. But if you just wanted the very basics and you followed those three principles, you should have a great, strong, thick lawn. Thank you so much for being with us, Scott. Uh, of course, learning about lawn care from Scott is always great, and we hope to have you back later on in the season. Oh, well, again, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Coming up next, Into the Kitchen with Chef Rachel. Come and explore the new Terra, where color lives. AM 900 CHML is giving you more news when you want it most. Non-stop news weekday mornings 5 till 9, weekday afternoons 3 to 6, with weather and traffic on the 9s. Hear about it first from AM 900 CHML, Hamilton's news talk leader. Once again, and welcome back to the Terra at Home Kitchen, where we're joined by Chef Rachel Johnstone. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Chris. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Good. We're looking forward to Good Friday. Mm -hmm. So, as a bit of a twist on an old favorite, usually we're cooking fish. Mm -hmm. So instead, we're going to go with a nice appetizer. Tell mm -hmm. us what we're making. A little appetizer of fresh sea scallops. Mm. Um, so we're going to sauté them in the pan. A little bit of a lemon cream sauce on a bed of greens. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Heat up our pan. Naturally. Yep, that's how we usually start here when we're searing things. <laughs> um, we want it to be nice and hot with uh, 
lots of oil so it doesn't stick, okay? Um, Seems we start this way often. Nice hot pan, some olive oil, and we're good to, to begin. Yes. So, let's get that heating. We'll season our scallops. Okay. So we just have some salt and pepper here. I would say for an appetizer portion, um, maybe three scallops, three to four scallops a plate, depending on uh, how much your guests like them. Yes. <laughs> um, so you can buy them accordingly. We'll just put a little bit of salt and pepper on each. Is there a trick to choosing scallops? Um, how do you tell if they're fresh? Um, when you're buying fish, you want to always make sure, like we have uh, discussed in the past, that um, you know it's not smelling too fishy, um, it's not uh, slimy in texture. Yep. Um, those are kind of the the basic notes. Not brown, you know, a nice fresh white color. Okay. A little bit of pink in there. Um, yeah. So don't be afraid to you know ask your your grocer to smell them because that's one of the main um, the main things when you're picking fish is the you, obviously it's going to smell like fish but if it's a little too overpowering maybe it's a little too old to be cooked. And ours smell nice. They smell I don't know oceanic mm -hmm. but not fishy. <laughs> All right so I'm just going to chop up a little bit of garlic too. I like to put some garlic in here for some extra flavor. It's okay. always um, Always a good, good thing to put in your oil when you're when you're searing things, especially things like scallops. Garlic and garlic and scallops, garlic and shrimp are so so good. So mm -hmm. garlic really complements a lot of seafood really well with with butter or olive oil as well. Right. So you're okay. getting that chopped down nice and yeah. fine. All right. So we'll just throw that in now. Um, the pan's really hot, so you want to just keep your eye on it because you don't want the garlic to, to burn. It will get dark fairly quickly. Okay. Okay, so make sure that's on high and just heat that up. Okay. Now the scallops are ready to go in. They don't take very long. Okay. Uh, maybe one to two minutes per side. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, you want that nice, oops, a nice sizzle sound. Put the scallops in. Um, with the seasoned side down, and then we can uh, season the other side of the scallops. Right, the garlic's starting to get really dark there, so we'll just turn it down a bit. Yeah. All right. Whew. They're working in there. Beautiful, yeah. So for our cream sauce, 35% um, cream, a little bit of lemon juice, um, some white wine, we'll deglaze the pan after. Okay. Uh, we're going to add in some fresh herbs to this too. Yum. Another option is some um, um, chopped capers. Mm. I think it's a really nice uh, a really nice flavor with the lemon and the cream. It's a nice pair. All right, so we'll continue to season this other side there. And they're probably ready to flip. You just want to see a little bit of color when you flip them over? You do, and that's not quite as dark as I want. So we'll okay. just... Uh, We'll just keep it up a little more. You know, I like this this sort of different take on an Easter meal where we're making it maybe a little more upscale and less traditional. So you could start off a great meal this way um, with with scallops. You could go through a whole seafood course, really. Exactly. Um, it can really begin the night any way you want. For sure, because I I don't um, I don't think appetizers are really something that. You know, you do unless you're having a really fancy dinner party. The way I think of it, you know, uh, Easter dinner is normally just traditional. You'll have lamb or you'll have ham. Yep. Say, right? Um, for me, anyways, this this is different to have a fancy appetizer before the before the traditional meal. All right. So we'll flip those over. They're looking great. They're starting to sort of break open a little bit now. Mm hmm. They look really good. So. We'll continue them here for a moment. Just keep them going. Um, take them out and put them on the plate. Okay. So they can sit out on the plate for a couple minutes while we make the sauce. It's not going to take too long to get the sauce going. Um, we want to have it simmering in the pan um, to kind of reduce and thicken. Then we put the scallops back in, toss them. That way, um, if they're not completely cooked when you take them out of the pan, they'll finish the cooking in the sauce. Okay. Right? That makes sense. Okay. So this is looking really good. So. Take them out. 
There we go. Yeah, they're nice yeah. and seared now. They look very good, so. You have to be careful because like any other, um, you know, white fish that you cook, these, these little scallops are very delicate. So maybe a nice spatula would be good or tongs if you're careful. Now making a great sauce to go on top of anything that we're searing is made more simple by the searing process because you've got all that delicious caramelized stuff going on in the bottom of the pan. And that's that's right. Form the basis of our sauce. Yeah, it's it's definitely it definitely helps when you're when you want to make a nice sauce to sear to sear first. So those are ready. Um, this still very hot as you can see. Turn it down a bit, and we will deglaze this with the white wine. Okay. You hear that sizzle? Yeah. That's what we want. And get all those bits up from the bottom. Um, and then at this point, we just add in the lemon juice and the cream. And I'll get you to get me a little bit of lemon verbena, which is the herb that we're using today. And we'll just chop that up and put that on top. Lemon verbena is such a wonderful, fresh flavor that I think is really underused in cooking. So I'm excited to see us using this one. We're gonna go and uh, work on this sauce. When we come back, we'll show you how to throw those herbs in for more Tara at home. Come and explore the new Terra, where color lives. AM 900 CHML is giving you more news when you want it most. Non-stop news weekday mornings 5 till 9, weekday afternoons 3 to 6, with weather and traffic on the 9s. Hear about it first from AM 900 CHML, Hamilton's news talk leader. Tara at home where Chef Rachel is giving us a fantastic appetizer option for the Easter weekend. Rachel, we've got our scallops simmering in their really lovely cream sauce and we're just about ready to add some lemon verbena for a bit of a fresh burst of flavor. Mm -hmm. Lemon verbena is so nice. Like The smell is unbelievable, the mm -hmm. lemon. Uh, so we had uh, the sauce simmering. When it started to thicken up a bit, put the scallops back in and just toss them, turn them so they got coated. And we'll put the, the lemon verbena in now at the end of the cooking so we keep all that good flavor there. Wonderful. If you put it in at the beginning, some of the flavor cooks out. So right at the end is ideal. We keep that nice fresh green color too when we put it in a bit later as well. Another option mm -hmm. you could throw in for this as well is uh, lemon thyme. So we've got some lemon thyme here and that's a good option if you don't have verbena or can't find verbena, lemon thyme could work really well as well. Exactly. Yeah. Stick with the lemon theme for yeah. this because of the, the lemon juice that's in there. So like I said, about three or four per plate. So we just have a nice bed of greens here. So we'll do four. There we go. And we'll spoon some of the sauce over top. Really nice, fancy looking, but not too complicated. No, it was quite appetizer. simple. And it looks lovely. It looks like spring. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll spoon this over top and you can garnish it maybe with some of that thyme. Sure. And of course, you can find this and all of Chef Rachel's recipes online at terragreenhouses.com. Have a very happy Easter, everyone, and join us next week for another Terra at Home. Come and explore the new Terra, where color lives.